Good afternoon. Uh, this is the fourth uh, discussion uh, session that we are having. And uh, unfortunately, Professor Parsu Raman couldn't be with us uh, instead. Uh, Professor Cecil Roy is going to uh, be the respondent for the paper by Professor Sion Raman. The nature of mind from neuroscience and physics perspectives. Okay. Please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Professor uh, Shion Raman, I, I must appreciate his approach. And uh, he raised several issues which should be uh, carefully done in future research. I mean, he has mentioned several areas of research which are very important in modern neuroscience research uh, and also from the physics perspective. And uh, many people, yeah, yeah. No. nowadays many people, mean, I mean almost all the neuroscientists, they are using uh, kind of toys like EEG, EMG or fMRI but I'm taking the activity of the neuron and from there they are trying to infer something but the problem is that from a scientific perspective if there is a stimulus some cortical areas will be activated and from that activity scientists will say well uh, that event which is happening in the outside world that gives rise to this kind of activity and we have neuronal correlates. But from the strictly scientific point of view, this is not true in the following sense. Because this is not one-to-one -one correlations. There might be several regions behind that and for several regions, particular cortical area might be activated. So only if people can do the reverse experiment, activate that particular region and see whether you are feeling really uh, happy or comfortable and then uh, like seeing a television and feeling happy and activating that particular area I will say I don't need to look into the television but I am feeling happy but that kind of experiment is uh, of course inv invasive and it is very risky though some progress has been made they made some you know uh, nano wiring in uh, MIT and uh, they are trying to put the nano air in the blood vessel and they are trying to think of doing experiment but ethically whether it is uh, you can do it or not that's a big ethical question uh, anyhow and uh, even his holiness also uh, raised a very important question which uh, Shion, Shion also raised a similar question that uh, brain processes not only information I mean it is Carl Pibram he used to say uh, oftenly that uh, brain not only process information but it also interprets like you are looking at an apple and uh, some stimulus is coming from apple and it is falling on your retina then it is being processed and at a certain stage you say ah oh, this is apple so that moment you are giving an interpretation so information has two aspects one is semantic aspect and syntax and up till now, I can say, in modern science, people develop a information theory based on Shannon or whatever other. That is mainly not, they don't bother about semantic aspect. So, uh, for living beings especially, or living sentience, people need to develop a new information theory, which not only say, uh, process information, how information processes, but also gives meaning. This is one of the really challenging area uh, Sion uh, rightly pointed out and then he he found a very uh, intriguing result. This, this uh, I, I am really thinking for a couple of years like he is telling the time perception in the brain and he uh, found from some, some simple experiment like this and uh, uh, what is the minimal time period for that he calculated like of the, of the order of milliseconds.
But this is very strange, because uh, strange not in a bad sense, uh, because if you look at the uh, functioning of the brain, there are several type of oscillatory waves like alpha, beta, gamma and delta waves. And gamma oscillations, high frequency wave, this is usually called, uh, this is usually uh, thought to be associated with awareness. So, in our awakening state and in RAM sleep, dream sleep, the gamma oscillations dominate. Now, from a school level calculation, if you take the spectrum of the gamma oscillations, 40 hertz oscillations, then the time period exactly 10 to 14 milliseconds, what he quoted from simple Buddhist experiment. So I don't know how uh, the, those days Buddhists found uh, exactly the same time period, which uh, not only orders, he told 13 milliseconds or 12 milliseconds, and modern neuroscience says 10 to 14 milliseconds. So this is really amazing. And maybe uh, if people who are uh, uh, learned Buddhist scholars here, they can say how really they got this time for perception. And then, uh, yeah. Uh, another thing she, uh, Rion, uh, Sion uh, was uh, also mentioning that that is a long history. Uh, it was that uh, if you, I mean, in a run, uh, before running, there, there is anticipation time, apprehension time. So uh, this was first done by neuroscientist Divet, and then subsequently it was done recently by through fMRI and uh, MEG experiments. So the issue is there is an unconscious process going on before the action and that unconscious time is significant. So there is very uh, difficult issue is connected regarding the existence of free will. If there is unconscious activity because of the systemic evolution or systemic dynamics then where comes the existence of free will? These questions is now debated among neuroscientists and physicists all over the world, whether really uh, free will exist in brain functions or not, or in which way it exists. Because there are two processes can be related to the dynamics of this uh, neuronal dynamics. One is random process, one is deterministic process. Even in a deterministic process, there is a phenomenon discovered called chaos theory. I mean, even it is fully deterministic, in the sense, if you know the initial position and time, you can say what will be the future position and time of the system itself. That is dictated by Newtonian equation. But even within that system, if the system is nonlinear, then if you change slightly the initial point, then after certain Instant, after a certain instant, you will find that chaos will appear. That is called chaos theory. And this is most difficult even in classical paradigm, even without going into quantum theory, this is one of the challenging issues, how really chaos appears. Even within that paradigm, it is also very difficult how free will arises. So these are the issues. I mean, he has discussed a lot of uh, important issues, but which should be discussed very carefully. And then, Uh, yeah, other issues he also mentioned, like uh, uh, I can make some comments, like uh, he mentioned uh, superluminal transmission of light. But up till now, uh, I can tell you that even the latest experiments which have been done to detect the speed of the light, uh, the error bar they have calculated, and it does not really say that speed can, uh, light can move faster than uh, which is the speed is 3 to the 10 to the power 10 centimeters per second. So, though people speculated that if the light can move faster than what is a 3 to 10 to the power 10 centimeters per second, a lot of things might happen. But experimentally, uh, the situation is uh, not like that. So, wh what I can say that he raised many, many interesting issues which uh, can be discussed even. Uh, in comparison to Indian, uh, ancient Indian wisdom, Buddhist and non-Buddhist tradition also.
Thank you, Professor Roy. very brief and try to uh, answer those questions. If we believe what Buddha is able to see the future events, if we also believe Buddha's text that some of the attributes of the mind or, or the mental consciousness it can engage with an object very quickly, spontaneously, then you have to find some models which are not confined by the speed of interaction, but more like at, a, at the same time. Now, within that framework, you can use quantum entanglement, or you can also look into faster than light. If you were to depend that since it has not been proven, therefore it doesn't happen or it doesn't exist, then there is no point in having a dialogue on that. All the physics of uh, faster than light is based on the assumptions. If it was possible, then what might be the uh, properties of that phenomena are? And within that framework, there are several papers on it. So within that framework, I was using to describe that if you travel faster than light, then the space-time coordinate interchange and therefore a causality or the past, present and future have no meaning. Now let's leave it at that and then we can discuss it later on. Let's turn to the brain. Uh, the so-called so gamma oscillations in the brain which we see, they are in the anywhere between the a range of, uh, most people will say between 30 to 80, but nowadays even higher. Uh, if you filter the data in that band, you will see the gamma oscillation, uh, I mean gamma waves which are connecting different parts of the brain. But even within that band, you will see the band amplitude sort of changing like that. And these are often in, EEG terminology is called theta gamma coupling, alpha gamma coupling, or beta gamma coupling. Here I will focus only on the alpha gamma. Alpha frequency or alpha shutter refers to eyes open, eyes closed, which could be anywhere between 8 to 14, but about 10 might be a good number. So. Even in the gamma wave or gamma oscillations, you will see that alpha band present. Similarly, you can also have a theta wave present, which relates to slight amount of relaxation, or beta waves, where it could, which is also about mind is doing some things in there. So, uh, so all these complicated structures are present. Now looking at the brain processes, it depends where you are looking, what level. If you are looking at a sensory level, those processes are slow. We are talking about sense of the smell, touch, or looking at things. There we are talking about anywhere between uh, 5 hertz to say 100 hertz maximum, cycles per second. But if you jump one step backward, when you are at a tissue level, the neuronal firing may be at kilohertz frequency, higher frequency. If I jump into cell level, we are talking about microsecond level. Now all these processes are happening. It is what type of instrument and what type of analysis you want to do to look what brain is doing. Now, uh, the phase the thing which I talked about, I talked only about at a slow rate of uh, zero, uh, 0.01 uh, seconds, 
that was just to bring out that what Buddhist philosophers talked about and where this uh, so-called episodic nature of the brain where it is doing things then it suddenly goes into a low energy then it goes again and then jumps uh, to bring out what Vasubandhu and some and Chandrakirti and other uh, Buddhist philosophers have said but that's not the end of the story. I could go at a much faster rate and I see the formation of these episodic phase shifts uh, happening at a much higher frequency, say like a 1,000 hertz. And that data where episodic shift is happening at a 1,000 hertz, it becomes a, uh, it shows up in epilepsy localization. So like uh, if I look at EET data, there is no epilepsy present, but with that analysis, we can predict when is epilepsy going to happen because of these uh, episodic fishes. So, so that answer should be sufficient to say that there are many components to this analysis where you can find these answers. And uh, so other things, maybe over a cup of South Indian coffee someday and let the floor ask the questions and I'll be happy. Oh, there is. Yeah, from before. She, she wants to. Okay. Can I just uh, pose a question before I pass it on? Please. Yeah. So, uh, on the basis of your work, what would you say are the limits of human potential for growth? And uh, what are the possibilities of mental health? Especially the depression, you know, on the rise. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, I tend to be very optimistic. I think growth of human potential is enormous. It is, the sky is the limit. It is what our, I should say this, what our mind, the conscious, mental consciousness, is which could reside, I bless it, resides here and brain is here. It has many capabilities. And here I will just borrow terminology from the Lamaji. If you do generate <coughs> caring for other people, or let's use the big words, bodhicitta, compassion, and all that, you, you could help many people, which in turn will help other people, and combining all these things, you can transform a society. Uh, borrowing again, looking from the space, it is just one planet. I, I, even though we are still fighting, every country is buying airplanes and missiles, but let's work towards a future where national boundaries have no meaning and we are willing to share our, uh, what we have, our knowledge, our material resources, life will be very different. We as a human being have a potential to achieve that. That doesn't mean that we all have to become saints like Milarepa and go and live in mountain. You could do exactly the same thing what you are doing, but you can still do all these things. Now coming back to medical research and especially depression or mental anxiety, uh, well, there are many medications, then also you can train your mind. Uh, a combination of all these things will work. For most of us who have an anxiety, a, a little bit of uh, medication like lorazepam or something would help you out, but that doesn't mean it solves the problem. Trust me, uh, happiness or even Calmness doesn't come in a bottle of pills. You, you have to develop your mind to, to go in that direction. So, uh, so there is a lot of tools can be utilized. Medicine and mind training and many other ways to deal with the mental problems. Thank you. Professor Bandhavan. No, it's not working. I'd like to know something from Professor Raman. Uh, 
while I was working on uh, a research project related to dreamless sleep and dream, uh, I read a paper, I read in a paper that uh, modern neuroscience uh, has established this fact uh, by experimental means that whenever a person has objective consciousness, that is awareness of certain objects, then uh, there are gamma waves um, uh, in the brain of at least uh, 40, uh, I may be wrong in stating this, of 40 uh, kilohertz, uh, no, 40 hertz, uh, 40 hertz, uh, uh, 40 hertz uh, strength, uh, but uh, so it shows that when a person undergoes non-rapid eye movement sleep, uh, in that state also, a person has uh, from, uh, uh, gamma waves of uh, that 40 hertz uh, strength. So, the, this corroborates uh, some of the Indian theories uh, which state that even during dreamless sleep, uh, a person may have objective awareness. While there are theories uh, which uh, claim that uh, during dreamless sleep, that is non-rapid eye movement sleep, a person cannot have uh, any objective awareness. But it seems that experiments, neuroscientists, uh, neuroscientific experiments can clinch the issue in favor of one of these two sides, one of these two Shion, can I uh, respond? Yeah. No, uh, what you were saying a uh, couple of years before, uh, very serious neuroscientists, they found that uh, in awakening state as well as in dream state, uh, gamma oscillations is predominant, but in the deep sleep, low frequency oscillations are dominant. So the issue is whether, now I am speaking whether in a dream state or I am in awakening state, because my gamma oscillation says that I might be one of the two states. Only they are looking whether there is kind of phase transition happening which can differentiate with my average state and dream state. That, that's very interesting issue. But in the deep sleep, uh, no, no gamma state is predominant, only delta and other low frequency oscillations. Do you like to comment? Uh, much time okay. now, you know, we have to be very brief. Maybe we can talk later on and I can explain. So my comment is really, and we don't have to get into this discussion because I think it'll take long, but something that you mentioned about the anticipatory consciousness. And this actually relates to Tupten's uh, threefold theory. So it occurred to me, as you were saying that, that there's also in, in the Buddhist text a variety of terms that are used for, not for actual consciousness, but for states that will become conscious. And the, in terms like bija or vasana or anushaya, what is balanya in Sanskrit? Balanya. Anushaya is anushaya. anushaya. So, this it seems to me that if we want to talk about consciousness, maybe it's not necessary to take these things into account because strictly speaking, these things are not conscious. Con conscious. But if what we want is a theory of mind from a Buddhist point of view, then it seems to me that we have to take these notions of latent states um, that, are, that exist within the mind and that make other states possible without which other states cannot arise and that this might be similar to this notion of anticipation. Yeah, yeah, this is very important. Yeah. Maybe so, uh, thank you, you very much. I think, you know, we have to stop here. Yeah. Okay. We have to move on to the next person, the next discussant. Thank you. Maybe you can have a discussion later on. Sorry, I can't, you know, have another question from the floor. We're running out of time.